Hello, everyone. Welcome to Albany State University. I am Angela Peters, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs. And today is a glorious day. Today is the day in which you are going to present your creative and scholarly works under the mentorship of wonderful, stellar, esteemed faculty here at Albany State University. Participating in undergraduate research can provide you so many opportunities. It can also contribute to the creation of new knowledge, and it can sharpen your critical and your analytical thinking skills. But I want you to know today, students, that undergraduate research is a high impact practice, all right? This is a high impact practice that you are involved in. Research experience allows you to better understand your published works. It allows you to learn to balance collaborative and individual work. And it helps you to determine an area of interest. And it really helps you to jumpstart your career as a researcher. So the fact that you are participating in undergraduate research helps you clarify a career path. And that is very, very valuable. Here at Albany State University, you are able to develop skills in critical thinking and communication and these skills are going to help you emerge as leaders in so many professions after you graduate. You are having an amazing opportunity, not only today, but throughout your experience as you're being mentored by a faculty member. I just wanted to congratulate you on the amazing work that you're doing with research and with creative projects here at Albany State University. We are honored to be walking with you as you navigate through the ASU experience and as you receive your degree. Congratulations on your presentations today. Greetings from the Office of Title III Programs. My name is Sandra Moody, the Director of Title III Programs. Today's contemporary college students are faced with many challenges that can impede their academic progress. We are constantly reminded of the national goals of college completion, the gap between college graduate abilities and employers expectations. There are also a lack of adequate amount of STEM majors, especially among minorities. Therefore, institutions search for ways to improve academic programs, student services and engagement that will improve academic performance as well as meet global demands. Albany State University's investment in high impact programs such as undergraduate research through Title III funding benefits everyone from the students, the institution, and the community. As a result of this program, our students are acquiring knowledge in their academic field that transcends classroom study. Our faculty are connecting with students and fostering positive learning experiences. As historically expected of higher education institutions, solutions are formed under research programs to address social, economic, educational, and health issues that are of concern nationally and globally. We have numerous great research projects that are produced under the Center for Undergraduate Research. The Office of Title III commend you on your efforts and encourage other faculty to consider joining this initiative. We welcome you to witness and engage in the sessions as allowed. The Office of Title III welcome you to the ninth Annual Regional Undergraduate Research Conference. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Mark Thomas. Welcome to the ninth Annual Regional Undergraduate Research Symposium at Albany State University. This year has been a kind of tough year due to COVID challenges. Some research projects simply could not be completed. I mean, it's hard to go out in the community and do research, you know, when you're in lockdown and things like this. However, we had a lot of research that was completed and we have some really great projects. I want to introduce Dr. Daniel Carruth. He's Associate Research Professor at Mississippi State University's Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems. He's the Associate Director of the Advanced Vehicle Systems Research Group at the Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems. His Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems Research Group currently employs seven undergraduate researchers and nine graduate researchers from multiple departments. And the Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems 
currently employs 95 undergraduate student workers. Dr. Carew's research interests lie in modeling and simulation of autonomous ground vehicles in military off-road environments, human interaction with autonomous vehicles, the use of UGVs by military and law enforcement, as well as physical and cognitive aspects of human task performance in law enforcement, military, and industrial applications. His current research efforts are focused on generating virtual environments and test standards for military off-road autonomous vehicles, building off-road autonomous vehicle platforms for real-world testing, and developing virtual greenhouses for training undergraduate students in electronic control systems for precision agriculture. Dr. Carruth contributes to the NATO Applied Vehicle Technology Panel Research Task Groups focused on modeling and simulation of military ground vehicles. He's published over 100 conference proceedings and articles. He has received over $15 million in funding from agencies such as DOJ, uh, DOD, USDA, NIJ, and BGA, as well as other agencies and private funding sources. Dr. Carruth, we appreciate your time and welcome to the unsinkable Albany State University. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Daniel Carruth. Hello, everyone. I am very excited to have the opportunity to be here virtually with you today to recognize your work, to learn more about your research, and to talk about the importance of undergraduate involvement in research. I want to quickly thank Dr. Thomas and Ms. Millich for the invitation to speak to you today. On a personal note, I've known Dr. Thomas for quite a long time. We went to school together and have worked together on a few different research projects. There's something interesting about running around shooting things as part of research, and you should ask Dr. Thomas to tell you some stories about the work we've done together. It's great that you have access to a resource like the Center for Undergraduate Research that works to involve students in research activities. It's very exciting that you get to do research and participate in events like these. Research is the foundation of progress. It is the act of understanding. The arts, service, and business fields are as involved in research as science, technology, engineering, and math. A more rigorous definition would say that research is studious inquiry or examination, or alternatively, to search or to investigate exhaustively. In a sense, though, research applies to everyone. When you go buy a car, you start off by going to CarMax, or you go to Jalopnik, uh, you visit car lots, and you check your bank account. You're exploring your options. When you read about your favorite celebrity or athlete, you see what they're wearing, check out their stats from the last game, you're seeking knowledge. When you study the latest dance moves for your next performance, you're keeping up to date with the state of the art. When you examine light from the furthest stars to understand how they burn, we're doing research. Now, maybe all of those aren't systematic or exhaustive, but it is you in the act of understanding. Often, when we talk about research, we mean opportunities like those provided through the Center for Undergraduate Research. Opportunities like the ones that you've had, that you've participated in. Chances to challenge yourself, to develop new skills, and to systematically study a topic of interest to you. I have a personal stake in believing that research is important. It's what I do. Every day, I have the privilege to come into work and exhaustively investigate some really amazing things. We use virtual reality to study human behavior. How will people interact with robots and autonomous vehicles? Or how can we train workers to do new tasks? We're building autonomous vehicles. I get to watch students like you working to understand how vehicles can drive through forests or climb through ditches on their own. I get to see vehicles driving themselves. Now that doesn't mean that every day is perfect. When I say that research is exhaustive, I mean it in more than one way. I spend most of my waking hours thinking about research. It's the kind of work that goes home with you. I bet some of you have been exhausted by your projects, 
students and mentors alike. More than smarts, research takes commitment and perseverance, especially in a year like this one. And I applaud your commitment to this program and your will to continue studying and working on your research. Luckily, we don't do research alone. First, we're always building on the work of those who have come before us, whether that's our family, our teachers, our mentors, or our predecessors and peers in research. Everything that we do builds on the work of those who have come before. Second, the questions that we're asking are too big for one person. Those self-driving vehicles that we work on, they need to see the world around us. They need to understand that world. They need maps of the world. They need to know how to act in the world, how to communicate with people. Even the car, without the self-driving technology, requires teams of people to design, build, and maintain it. There are also too many questions. I'm sure it feels like there's so much that we know when you think about all the courses that you're taking. But I've never had a shortage of questions to ask. And research leads to more research. If you and I sat down and talked about your project, and maybe someday we'll have that chance, we would find that you, all of you, ended your project with more questions. It's a rare project that ends just in answers. To address the research questions that we have, we draw from multiple disciplines, engineering, psychology, sociology, agriculture, sports, nursing and medicine, and business. All have people in my labs. We are bringing in people from everywhere to work on the problems that we find interesting or that someone with funding finds interesting. We have far more ideas for research than we have people to do research. We need researchers like you, not just in academics. Although academia is fine, it's competitive, rewarding, exciting, and strange. All those things. But also in industry, in government, in the military, they need researchers to address a wide breadth of problems. Programs like this help to build knowledge. You've developed skills and expanded your mind to apply yourself to research in any field, in industry or in academics. Involvement in research prepares you for the future, in the workforce, but also in other parts of your life. It can arm you with tools against misinformation. It can help you weigh those options, like which car you want to purchase. It helps you to think more deeply about almost everything in your life. Why is it important to involve undergraduates? First, all of those skills, those tools that you can gain through research, everyone should have those experiences. Second, I'll appeal to authority and note that the National Science Foundation has specific funding and specific programs dedicated to encouraging undergraduate involvement in research. This summer, there will be programs happening across the country hosting undergraduates like you to do research. What do you gain? What, what do students get by being involved in research? I like to think about what's different about research activities compared to the classroom. In a typical class, usually you're going to get the facts and you're going to get the methods. And we package them so that we can cover them quickly, so that we can cover everything that we need to cover in the contents of a course. We try to keep the problems neat and tidy so that you can learn to apply the method and see where you're getting it correct and where you're making mistakes. In research, though, you get an unstructured problem. Often, it's usually open-ended. We don't already know the answer. Sometimes we're not even sure that there is an answer. You get to work with the tools of research, software, statistics, things that you will touch on in a course, but that you don't have the opportunity to really delve deep into before you're already moving on to the next topic. You also get exposure to the process. There's more to research than just the science. There are also administrative parts. 
you have to write a proposal that gets sent off to someone else to decide whether or not this is worthy of research activities. You may have had to work with the IRB or IACUC if you were doing human subjects or animal subjects research. You've got to learn how to generate reports to send back to whoever it was that decided that this project was worthwhile. All of those experiences help you to build a deeper understanding of your topic, not just the facts, figures, and methods, but the making of the sausage. You learn how do you go from an idea? How do you take that most basic question and do the work to find an answer or not? Failure is part of research. Really, I think it's a critical part. We learn a lot from failure and learning how to recognize those lessons, those accomplishments, and try again with a different approach or move on to the next question. Those are valuable life lessons, not only for research, but for the rest of your life. And if you're only working on problems that you know have an answer, are you really moving forward the state of the art? You should be challenged by your research. Projects like these can help you learn about yourself. To do this work, you have to have a little self-motivation. And you can learn something about who you are as a person. What is it that you really want to know? What is it that you want to do? Are you willing to put in the work to accomplish those things? You can also learn what part of this work excites you. There are certain things about research that I really enjoy. And some of them aren't things everyone enjoys. I love the budgeting part. I like spending money. <laughs> Maybe somebody else doesn't like that part so much. What part did you hate? When you were doing this project, there's always a piece that you maybe didn't want to work on. I'm not a big fan of the reports at the end. So what you can do is you can find what part you like to do and find collaborators that enjoy the parts that you're not as excited about. They make great team members. Research projects are pressure cookers. It's an opportunity to put yourself under pressure, learn about yourself, and develop skills that are helpful in research and other parts of your life. Something else that's different about research. In class, what do we typically do with an assignment? The professor will assign the task. You'll go off and complete it, give it back. They'll grade it. They give you the grade, and then you trash it and move on to the next assignment. Here, I hope that this was more than an assignment. I hope that you gained something. I'm sure that you gained something extra from this work. I can't bear to delete the folders that have my dissertation in it. It wasn't particularly good. It was done, and that was good enough. But the blood, sweat, and tears, those digital bits are important to me, and they're a part of me. I hope this project is just a small part of you. Also, you demonstrated performance. What you did here will impress recruiters. Whether you continue to pursue research, maybe going on to graduate school, or you go directly into the workforce and industry, employers recognize that this kind of activity results in transferable skills, communication, writing, teamwork, and problem solving. Being involved in research pays dividends. I've got a student, Warren Wheeler, for the last few years, he's worked for me as an undergraduate student. I met Warren during prep for an experiment. We had a robot, it was at the library, and we were planning how we would drive it around and give out candy for Halloween. So what was the research question? We were actually testing to see how much candy would someone take from an unaccompanied robot. Unsurprisingly, people took more candy than, from the robot by itself than when we had a human companion follow it around. Anyway, Warren, he walked up in the library and asked us, how can I get involved? That's some motivation. We brought him into the lab. He's worked for me for a number of years now, and he's building models as a graduate student that describe how rainfall affects the ground for simulations of autonomous vehicles. I can draw a seemingly random bouncing line from pushing buggies at Walmart in high school 
to doing web development in my undergraduate years to today. I didn't go to school to get a PhD. I definitely didn't go to school thinking I would end up with a PhD in psychology. But I took the opportunities that came along and they've rewarded me as I've moved into my career. I get to play with autonomous vehicles and I get to build video games to help train future workers. I've had the opportunity to travel the world. My work for NATO has taken me to Greece, Norway, and Slovakia, and I've made friendships that will last the rest of my life. I get to participate in events like these. I learn about the work that is being done by students like you. I get to be impressed by that work, and I get to be inspired by the work that you're doing. I've been incredibly lucky and blessed, but these opportunities came along because of the research that I was involved in, and opportunities like these can be yours too. I've got two general tips for you. First, you should recognize your accomplishments. There are about 5,000 to 6,000 students at Albany State University, and there's something like 30 here today. You are excelling and you should recognize that you are excelling. You should celebrate every accomplishment. You should absolutely celebrate like this. When you accomplish things that other people recognize are wins, finishing a project, getting admitted to graduate school, starting your career, but you should also celebrate the personal wins. When you finish a paper, even before anyone else looks at it, maybe even if you've just finished a paragraph, when you write a proposal, when you just have a great idea, celebrate that. Research is not a straight path. It can be a frustrating game. We focus on the big wins, finding the answer, getting the funding, but you should recognize all of your accomplishments, big and small. Be proud of yourself and your work. Second, share those accomplishments. TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, articles, journal papers, posters. Tell your mom. Share all of those accomplishments. They're important and make sure the world knows that you are here and that you've accomplished something. If you don't share your work, how will anyone know that you did it? How will anyone benefit from your work? How will you benefit from your work? The doors don't open unless you knock. The research didn't happen unless the results are shared. Knock on every door. Run down the street yelling at the top of your lungs, I did this. Or as we do here at State, ring your cowbells. Share your accomplishments. It will pay off. Thank you for your work. Thank your mentors, your professors, and your family. Thank the Center for Undergraduate Research and this great institution. I want to thank you again for the invitation to speak today. I hope this is just part of a lifelong adventure in research, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the virtual conference. Hello, I am Brenda Hernandez. I'm a senior majoring in psychology at Auburn State University. My mentor is Professor Cassandra D. Jordan. So today I will be presenting my research entitled Social Psychological Impact of Social Media on Teens in Rural South Georgia, postulating Dirk Heim's ideas of suicidal behaviors social integration, and regulation. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, suicide is the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 to 34. A significant risk factor of suicide is being between the ages of 15 to 24. Some risk factors include history of mental health issues, family history of depression, and being exposed to suicidal behaviors, including family members, peers, and media figures. 
in Durkheim's study of suicide, he found that Protestants are more likely to commit suicide than Catholics, men are more likely than women, single people are more likely than married people, soldiers are more likely than civilians, and during war times have a much higher rate of suicides than during peace times. So Durkheim concluded that the more socially integrated and connected a person is, the less likely he or she is to commit suicide. Social integration is defined as the presence of stable and durable relationships. Regulation is defined as the monitoring, oversight, and guidance that comes from social ties. Study of suicide attempts found that familiar integration measured by levels of emotional and material support within the family protects youth against suicide attempts. Robin Williams was a comedian and an American actor who committed suicide back in 2014. Before his death, there was an average of 113 to 117 suicide deaths per day in the United States. But after Williams' suicide, the average rate increased to 142 suicide deaths per day. Mallory Grossman was a 12-year-old girl who loved gymnastics and cheerleading. Unfortunately, Mallory was bullied by several girls from her school on social media and they called her nasty things and mean things about her. They even called her names. Mallory even made up excuses to not to go to school because of the incidents which then led her to eventually commit suicide and on the right picture uh, were Mallory's parents attending in a news conference as most people probably already know about the show of course majority are probably teens this show is on Netflix, 13 Reasons Why. The title is 13 Reasons Why. So, 13 Reasons Why is about a young girl, Hannah Baker, who committed suicide and she made 13 tapes explaining the reasons why she chose to end her life. So 13 Reasons Why this show that is popular on Netflix is responsible for the 28.9% increase in suicide rates among U.S. youth ages 10 to 17 in the month alone following the show's release. The number of deaths by suicide recorded in April 2017 was greater than the number seen in any single month during the five-year period. So the goal of this research is to raise awareness about the importance of familial and social integration as key agents of prevention of suicide as well as to educate individuals about the power of social media and its influence on teens' personal views 
about themselves, including thoughts of suicide and self-harm. The major hypothesis of the current study is are teens in rural South Georgia more heavily influenced by social media than teens in urban cities in the United States? And I was expecting to find that teens in rural South Georgia were not as heavily influenced by social media as teens in urban areas in the United States. A questionnaire using a rating scale of 1 to 10 was created to assess confidence, peer pressure, self-esteem, acceptance, body image, and depression. Three high schools designated in rural areas, grades from 9 through 12, was the population and demographics for the present study. An analysis of current research on teens and the influence of social media in urban areas will be used to compare the results of the study. Initially, in order to collect the data, the survey that was mentioned in the previous slide was developed. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and time constraints, I was not able to distribute the surveys and collect the data. So instead, I used existing data. So in this slide, this is the survey that was created. So on the first part of the survey, it's basically just asking about their, the, the participants' demographics. Along with the two questions asking if they have social media accounts. And if they do, they can just check whichever social media they use. The second part is about is is asking about is is more about social media of course. It's asking about how many hours per day they spend on social media and what's the purpose of using social what's the purpose of social, using social media and if they have any beliefs and decisions that have been influenced by media influencers and or if they feel more connected on social media and it also talks about the it also talks about confidence and self-worth and the last two parts of the survey are just asking to rate from 1 to 10 on confidence, peer pressure, self-esteem, acceptance, body image, depression, and stress that they believe social media has impact on. The significance of the research is that there has been an alarming increase in the number of teens who commit suicide solely based on the influence of the media it will also reduce the risk factors of suicide among teens in South Georgia by educating teens and their families about the importance of social integration and regulation. This study can be used as a resource for school counselors to use in workshops addressing suicidality among teens. Parents and teens can use this information to start a conversation about depression and suicide. And teens can use this study to start a support group among themselves. Previous studies have reported that teens and Americans in general who live in rural areas have much higher suicide rates than Americans in urban areas. 
Social media has a positive influence on teens, such as they can express themselves, they feel more connected with others, and they can do something that they might be embarrassed about to do that they that they can't do in person. And of course, social media also has its downfalls. So, for example, cyberbullying can lead to low self-esteem, which then can lead to depression and eventually suicide. The suicide of celebrities also increases the copycat effect. The study was conducted to understand the outcomes of social media and its influence on self-esteem, especially on youth. I also expected to find that teens are indeed heavily influenced by social media. Interestingly, research shows that there are benefits of social media such as teens being able to express themselves and feeling more connected to others, given that, of course, there are also negative impacts of social media. The data on teen suicide in rural areas was limited in the research. There was not a lot of research about um, teen suicide in rural areas. So there was really no conclusive evidence to support the hypothesis that teens in rural South Georgia are more heavily influenced by social media than teens in urban areas. So therefore, Further research should be conducted. And these are all my reference. The continuation and more reference. And that's the end of my research presentation. Thank you all, thank you all for listening. Good afternoon, my name is James Hawkins and welcome to my project for the Center of Undergraduate Research for the spring semester of 2021. Um, I work in partnership with Dr. Saha in the Department of Math and Computer Science and we did our project over the blocking of harmful electromagnetic radiation from 5G antennas. Finite size, finite size, thin metal strips were placed periodically in a dielectric host medium to block electromagnetic radiation of 5G frequencies. In this research, 3D electromagnetic radiation software HFSS was used to model this composite or artificial material. Simulation sh results show band stop behavior as expected. In addition to this, the factors affecting the cutoff behavior of the band stop medium were also analyzed theoretically and numerically. In 2002, this is the previous work. In 2002, Smith demonstrated uh, that a metal material composed of thin, infinitely long metal rods arranged in a host medium with a periodic fashion as it exhibits a blocking of low frequencies. The explanation is permittivity of the composite material becomes negative at lower frequencies, resulting in unrealistic signal speed, which means no transmission of signals. So essentially, the higher signals would bypass and the lower signals would get stopped. So this was our hypothesis development. Um, long thin wires can be modeled as inductance, offering low impedance at lower frequencies. And this is the formula that we use. And so by changing the strip link, L and C can be adjusted to determine a, a particular frequency to bypass. And so um, you know, essentially we just, uh, added the gap and once we added the gap we were able to stop and pinpoint uh what exact frequency that we want to stop 
So the simulation setup, uh, the width of the metal strip was 0.1 millimeters while the thickness was 0 0.018 millimeters. And the length of the metal, the different lengths of the metal strips that we use were 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 0.95 millimeters. And so these were the different simulation results that we got. I'll give you guys a minute to view them. Here's the second set. And so here are um, all of our results together. And as you can see, uh, as the strip length got longer, um, we got closer to the desired frequency, but our strip length can't surpass one because it's all the space that we have. So we're still having to uh, toy around and figure out what we need to do in order to uh, get the uh, frequency that we want to get blocked. And so um, here's another chart and you can see uh, the formula that we use to um, try to figure out uh, what frequency to block. And so, um, what we did, what we decided to do was um, we added uh, fins, little fins to the tip of the metal strips that we used to see uh, if it would make a difference in um, the level of frequency that it bypasses. And it does actually it um, bypass a lower frequency or it allow um, yeah, it, it bypassed a lower frequency. And so um, it still wasn't what we needed, but that was definitely some uh, great information for us to, uh, for us to learn. <clears throat> and so uh, the different factors that we learned were affecting the stop band behavior where the strip uh, was the length of the metal strip the host material, and then the lattice constant or periodicity, essentially how far spread out each metal strip is. Here, uh, as you can see on this chart, uh, we're getting closer to uh, the desired frequency. And um, the transmission coefficient, I could break it down. So um, essentially, what determines the transmission to pass through is basically whatever number is there, um, you divide it by 10 and then raise it to the 10th power. So um, negative 20, you divide it by 10, um, you get negative two and raise it to the 10th power. So 10 to the negative two is one over 100, which is 1% transmission. So, um, you know, another chart, uh, another visual for you guys. And so in conclusion, um, an artificial material composed of metal strips is modeled and frequency response is simulated. The proposed me strip medium shows band stop behavior as expected, but the cutoff frequency is determined by the resonance phenomenon. Proposed band stop material can be used as wearable device and specific applications, effective periodicity and material property will be investigated in the future. And so I'd like to give thanks to Dr. Saha for working in partnership with me and the Center of Undergraduate Research for allowing me and Dr. Saha the opportunity to pursue this research. And um, if there are any questions or anything, you know, feel free to send me any emails or anything like that. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Lynn Barnes. I am a junior health and human performance major, Spanish minor, mentored by Anna Gibbs, Dr. Timothy Hughley, and Dr. A. Ramune. The topic of my research is using a mobile application to determine the influence of a virtual five-week exercise program on static standing posture and university faculty employees. 
Low back pain and neck shoulder pain affect between 51 and 90 percent and 14 to 71 percent of people at some point during their lifetime. Low back pain and neck shoulder pain are considered to be major health problems that limit productivity at work and may have enormous medical and economic consequences. Studies show that neck shoulder pain is the third highest amount of health care spent in the U.S. with an estimated cost of $87.6 billion. Ferguson observed that with nearly 2,000 workers in various regions across the country, there is found to be a prevalence rate of 25% for low back pain that lasts at least one week. Roddy observed that workers that sit in certain positions for prolonged periods of time are at a higher risk for neck, shoulder, and back pain. Harmon observed that poor postural adaptations, along with muscle imbalances, have been shown to lower the functional quality of life. Faya also observed that particularly for workers sitting with poor posture at a desk or office chair for several hours a day. 75% of jobs today require individuals to sit behind a desk or chair for prolonged periods of time. Common postural abnormalities include forward head posture, forward head shoulder, forward head rounded shoulder posture, forward shoulder posture, or thoracic kyphosis. Various types of exercise programs have been designed to correct postural deformities and diminish pain that results from poor posture. These exercise programs include Pilates, stretching, and strength training. Targeted exercise programs to the pelvic region showed an improvement in stance stability with the shoulders and hips. Previous research has shown the positive effects of strengthening and stretching exercises used to improve posture, used to improve the posture of individuals exhibiting poor postural deviations. However, there is little evidence that have looked at postural stability and the effect of an exercise program and the faculty population. Understanding the different effects of exercises with the modern use of technology makes it possible to design programs on postural stability that focus on faculty and staff. Therefore, in this study, we propose to first investigate the influence of a virtual five-week exercise program on static standing posture and university faculty employees and hypothesize that there will be a decrease in postural deviations in university employees after a five-week virtual exercise program. The data collected from this research has the potential to determine the effects of exercise on university employees' posture. We also can provide information to assist professionals with injured patients who may suffer from mild or severe postural deviations, along with emphasizing the importance of exercise interventions for the purpose of correcting posture. After approval was received from the Institutional Review Board, we sent out multiple blast emails to all faculty and staff as a form of recruitment. Demographics, health history questionnaire, informed consent, and photo release were administered during the pre-assessment screening. Following completion of paperwork, we captured images of participants via posture screen mobile application. Anatomical landmarks were placed on the images for the app to produce postural deviations. Once we obtained the deviations, participants were given a WebEx URL and equipment needed to complete the program. The five-week exercise class structure is designed for a total of 45 minutes twice a week for five weeks. The class design consists of five minutes of dynamic warm-up movements, 20 to 25 minutes of lower and upper extremity strength training, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of static and dynamic stretching. We plan to add emphasis on the postural and corrective movement exercises via stretching and strengthening of the cervical and lower back muscles. TheraBands were distributed to participants during the pre-screening assessment. Here are two images of a exercise class that was held.
The study began with a total of eight participants and ended with two. Participants consisted of two female faculty members. There were no differences observed in height, weight, and BMI across pre and post assessment measures. Postural pre and post assessment data was compared via the Posture Screen mobile application to view comparison report. The report generated translations, which are shifts for the following views, anterior view and lateral view. The report also generated angulations, which are rotations for the anterior view. Reviewing the photos for participant one, both raters agree the curvature of the spine exhibits smaller deviations from the plumb line, which is an, Im an imaginary straight line from the top of the head to the floor. While viewing the client from the front view, her head, rib cage, and pelvic regions show a decrease in translation. The largest front view improvement was a decrease in hip displacement by 0.34 inches. From the lateral plane, the participant's shoulders and pelvis alignment also improved. In the right lateral view, participant one appears to be gazing upward, resulting in her chin to lift. Writers agree that this skewed results causing the effective head weight to increase and lateral translations slash angulations to increase as well. Reviewing the photos for participant two, both raters agree the curvature of the spine exhibits smaller deviations from the plumb line. While viewing the client from the front view, her head and rib cage regions show a decrease in shift. This improvement is, e is easily observed in the photos. The largest front view improvement was a decrease in head displacement shift by 0.92 inches. From the lateral plane, the participant increase in translation. From viewing, participant, from viewing the participant, it shows the pelvis has shifted backwards while the shoulders and knees are shifted forward. The left lateral view shows the participant improved lateral view posture with minimal deviation shown. Multiple photos in each plan may, be, may help in assuring accurate assessments. As seen with the previous participant, the effective head weight also increased. Participant 2's head weight increased by 21%. Both participants displayed an improvement in the anterior view, specifically in the head and rib cage. Similar to trends observed in this study, previous researchers have found exercise intervention focused on stretching and strengthening exercises to be effective in improving postural deviations. An observation in our study was the improvement of posture in the head and neck region among both participants. Similarly, Harmon found a 10-week at-home exercise program and improved an individual's postural alignment associated with forward head posture. Roddy also found that exercise intervention focused on stretching to improve posture in participants with forward head rounded shoulder posture. Klumper also found a significant reduction in postural deviations among swimmers following a stretching and strengthening intervention. Participant 1 also showed an improvement in shoulder posture. Our research was affected by the pandemic COVID-19. The pandemic caused a major fluctuation in both our participants and the methodology of conducting the research. With the result of COVID-19, the exercise program was held virtually via WebEx. People often prefer face-to-face -face exercise programs for many reasons. Lack of motivation outside of a workout setting, being uninformed about how to correctly perform exercises, and even the traditional way of life. Another limitation is the possibility of administrator error. When marking anatomical landmarks, administrator error is a possibility. To assure client comfort, clients were not required to wear minimal clothing. Clothing made finding the landmark is difficult, increasing possibility of error. Many participants reported Wi-Fi and connectivity errors associated with the WebEx program. Another limitation of this study is the sample size. The sample size of two limits the ability to make the data generalizable. 
Statistics were not able to be run on the postural displacements. Therefore, we had to simply look for possible trends among the participants. Lastly, participants are aware that images are being captured to assess posture, which may result in inaccurate photographs. Limitations in this study provide applicable insight for future studies. This pilot study gave the researchers insight on the utilization of the Posture Screen app. I believe this study provided researchers with experience needed to conduct a larger study in the future. Here are our references. I would like to give a special thanks to the Center of Undergraduate Research, Ms. Millage and Dr. Thomas, along with my mentors, Dr. Timothy Hughley, Aram Yoon, and Ms. Anna Fazio Gibbs. Thank you for your time and assisting me with my research. And thank you to the Center for Undergraduate Research again for the opportunity. Congratulations to our student researchers for the great research. I thank the many people without whose help our colloquium will not be possible. This includes our keynote speaker, Dr. Carruth, Albany State University support staff, Mr. McClinton and Mark Hum, Mr. Tabor and the ITS staff, our many mentors and other faculty volunteers, proposal reviewers, Dr. McCreary and the presentation judges, Ms. Moody and Ms. Wallace Butler with Title III, Provost Peters and Associate Provost Kadi, and President Frederick. In addition, I want to thank Ms. Millage, the Assistant Director of the Center for Undergraduate Research. Your efforts to support ASU undergraduate researchers is appreciated. With those acknowledgments, that concludes the ninth Annual Regional Undergraduate Research Symposium at Albany State University.